question. God asks the question. It's not that God loves us more, you know, or that we're any better, because we're not. We have the Orthodox Christian faith, we have Christ, that could change everything. But on the sociological level, if we simply put ourselves on the list, we already know where it's going to go. Don't have to guess. A little bit of analysis, and you don't even need that bothersome introductory course in statistics that they stick you with in psychology and other areas in order to understand. It's right there. Easy to interpret. So obviously, we need to radically revamp, change, in some respects, scrap our, our understanding of the church and get the real one which is not tied to religion, but tied to Christ as eternal life. Secondly, for us, this is where I would like to bring it home, so to speak, for us. We need to leave religion to embrace Christ. It's just as simple as that. Again, St. Paul didn't condemn the Greeks for doing what they did. If nobody told them anything different, how are they supposed to know? He says, God overlooks this. God, who is merciful and understanding, he didn't destroy you for doing this. But, now Christ has come, we have the resurrection, we have life, it's done. We also need to leave religion to embrace Christ. More specifically, we need to repent, like St. Like Paul told the Athenians, repent of our sins, but often our sins cannot be reached or understood because we have too many protective mechanisms, defense mechanisms, associated with religious behavior. And so we have to take them apart to be able to understand what a sin is and why it's a problem. The sin isn't a problem because somebody broke the rule of an organization. You and I know that as long as we're not breaking the government's rules, we're okay. Right? Yeah. We're fine. You break someone has an organization out there as a club, and we didn't know about the rules, and we break them. Who cares? Who cares? It doesn't make any difference. You know that some people look at the commandments of Christ that way. I mean, if you're into it, if that's your club, if that's your religious club, that's fine. People would say, that's cool. That's what you're into, go for it. It's not about that. If Christ is life, and sin is turning away from Him, what am I doing? When I sin, I'm facing death. What does death mean? It means I'm stuck in my biological life without Christ. What do I know as a 21st century person who got a little bit of an education? I know that biological life ends. That is a problem. It isn't just a religious problem, it's a problem that threatens my existence. Why wouldn't I care about it? Why wouldn't I do something about it? This is what needs to happen. And that's what it means to repent. Just in case you have a picture of what it means from some other source, or from watching TV or whatever it is, this is what it means to repent. Wake up to the reality and embrace Christ, Christ as life and leave the other stuff behind. To understand his, that His commandments reveal the personal relationship that we need to experience that personal relationship through prayer. Not as religious practice, but as being in communion with the source of life and with the truth. We need to let go of pseudo-religious images of God. They torment us. And how many times do I hear as a priest people saying, well, God this or God that. You know he's an easy target. If I try that with you, and I say, you're this and you're that, you're going to say, no, I'm not. 
God's the easy target, where we can impose all kinds of things onto him, and he doesn't talk back. That's one of the delightful things about religion, it allows us to vent, but none of that brings us to salvation. So we have to disabuse ourselves, get rid of some of these pseudo-religious images of God and discover how God is revealed in Christ. In other words, in very simple terms, read the New Testament. See what Christ says about himself. We need a fresh understanding of holy baptism as being that event in which we pass from death to life, where we move from the category of biological life to eternal life. Is that what we're all talking about when we get the families together? Is that what it's all about? I'm asking you the question. We need to participate meaningfully in Holy Communion. Why are all these priests bothering us with this all of a sudden? It used to be so easy, you know, when no one talked about it. Now we hear all these Orthodox priests getting on our case that we don't go to Communion enough. What's with them and me? Well, because Holy Communion is not a religious practice. Holy Communion is the way that Christ gives us. Am I worried about life and death questions? I think so. If I'm worried about life and death questions, I'm worried about the Eucharist. I'm worried about communion. Worried not in the sense that I'm going to get into trouble with it, but that it's a source of life for me. So I'm on it. According to the Fathers in the 4th century, Christians at that time were receiving communion on an average of three to four times a week. A week, a week. Not a month, a week. Just wanted to make sure that you knew I didn't mix up the words because of fatigue. I definitely <laughs> meant week. Teach me. Make it absolutely clear. What do we do with things like that? Well, they weren't very religious, were they? For our children, I've got to talk about this because it's painful, and we all know what's happening in almost all Orthodox parishes. There are brilliant exceptions. Not about blaming anybody, but simply stating the fact that there's a huge attrition rate. Huge attrition rate. The, the loss out of the churches is well over 50%. I'm just talking about the young people who went to church. The average is 60% in the United States of people who, young people who went to church and who reached 21, 22, and then they're gone. About 60% on a good day. That's what the, these statistics tell us. Why are they going? Well, if they understood what they got as religion, I don't need to give you any of the reasons why they're going. You've heard them all. They're all there. By the way, they're not irreverent, they're not silly, they're not atheists the way we use the term. Wish they would become atheists the way the Romans used the term. They're not. These people who leave, believe in God. They are. They're not atheists. Let's not try to sort of just get rid of the category. But if it really is all about religion, and if it isn't life and death, and if you're busy and if there are other critical issues, they just get squeezed out of your life. That's all. It doesn't mean that they want to do anything bad or that they don't believe in God. None of that's true. Good people. I meet them on a university campus. Good people. Lovely people. But they need to be held in the church through the rest of us modeling what that personal relationship with Christ looks like. What does it mean in someone's life practically when you relate to Christ as the source of your life? We need to help them distinguish between religion and Christ where they're going to go. 
It's not optional for us. If we don't help them, if we don't equip them, they're not going to stay, most of them. A minority will, but we know this, the, 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 the trends demographically. We need to help them find a peer group, people their age, who also know the difference between Christ and religion. And finally, we need to help them discover the living link between Christ and his church so that they understand what they're leaving, or perhaps is it who they're leaving. You're right. There's a lot in, the, in today's world which is similar to Rome, but we're very happy there's some big differences. Yeah, of course. So, <laughs> Not gladiators. <laughs> yeah, no gladiators. Not yet. Anyway. Sorry. Yes, yeah. Father, I'm going to ask you when you want to close this, because I think people... Hypothetically, you could be run. I'm not saying you would be, but you could be. You're vulnerable. If your church is body of Christ, you'll be as confusing to any government as the Christians were to the Romans. The Romans couldn't decide how they could control it. That must have been their first thought, was, okay, we've got a problem. How do we control it? And their final answer after studying it was, we can't. We can't control the thing, so let's wipe it out. Well, that was their answer. But at least they understood. They, understood. they got a lot right. They were irreligious and they couldn't be controlled. That much was correct. Of course, the horrible persecutions that ensued, nobody really wanted. Now we know some of the emperors were actually not well, mentally insane. So that would explain a few things too. But, yes? Two more questions. Oh, I, 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 why, why is St. John the first um, Gospel, gospel. In an Orthodox Gospel book. Mm -hmm. Because the first mm -hmm. service of the year, if you like, is Pascha, <laughs> the late thing. And the first Gospel is John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was God, the Word was with God. It's the first Gospel that's read. So everything revolves around Pascha. And since St. John's Gospel is the one that is read for Pascha, it has a priority. But then you can turn that question around, so why did they choose St. John's Gospel and not the others? It was the last Gospel to be written probably around the year 95, 60 years after Christ died and was resurrected. St. John wrote his Gospel. It was very deeply theological and reflective. And the church understood that this was the gospel that completed the other three. You know, a generation or two after the other gospels were written, St. John wrote his gospel while he was very, very old and still alive in the year 95, 96, whenever it was written somewhere around there. And it, and it enjoyed a kind of uh, special place among the Christians for 2,000 years. That made it have had a huge impact on the Orthodox Christian imagination, if I can put it that way, the liturgical way. So we took his prologue, the first verses of his gospel, to be the gospel for the late Pascha. And that's why when you open most books, I mean, it's not every single God Orthodox gospel that is arranged that way, because some of them are just a gospel, the, the kind of Bible you have on your shelf with the covers removed and a metal cover on it. But if you have one that is published by the church for liturgical use, then it's going to have St. John first. It's a great opportunity for me to be with you today. Um, the topic, as you heard, is the five most important lessons in life. And it might sound very pretentious, especially that the young priest is teaching uh, older people, uh, like myself, uh, what are the most important lessons in life. But I also have some gray hair. So you can say that right. there's a little bit of wisdom I, uh, I learned and gained uh, through 
my experience working as, uh, as a chaplain at the hospital with you know, dying, actively dying, uh, newly diagnosed, uh, with the families and the staff. And I, it, it humbles me, this experience, in the sense that uh, it helps me to, to see a little bit deeper in faith. Uh, why this particular topic? And uh, uh, most important, probably, like, how do you know those five lessons are really most important in life? Uh, I will share with you that I, I, I read a book by Richard Rohr. Some of you heard of him, and he wrote many books. Uh, some are better than the others. But uh, this one particular book is called The Adam's Return, where he explored rites of initiation in various cultures. So he actually did his research not only in his view, but he actually went to those places where some original people live. And he stayed and lived with them and kind of gathered this information. And eventually he came out with these five uh, topics or five simple things that I'm borrowing this idea from him. And I will add this to my own comments that uh, are very important. And we might say, like, well, what does it have to do with, with us? Like, Rights of initiation, this is some kind of uh, ethnocultural uh, research. But if you'll be patient with me, in the way to the end, you will see that it will make uh, will more sense to you. So, we know that presently we're all suffering uh, in the sense of uh, not just only losing numbers of people who go to church, but also we're losing uh, the whole identity especially manhood. So for the Richard, he'd been exploring and doing a lot of work with men, especially young men and, and older men. Because this whole thing with the manhood, who, what does it mean to be a man? We know that Me Too movement, we know all of this that, that, that um, is happening nowadays. And, and to know who you are as a man is it, it, it really a tough. But those who are women here, don't worry. You, you might learn some hints, some keys today. It also may help you to understand your better half, you know. Uh, and you might find some some ways that you can uh, can help your children, especially if you have boys, how to raise them. So as we know, at the present moment, we are no longer of cultural elders who know how to pass in wisdom, identity, and boundaries to the next generation. But when you Especially in the Orthodox theology, there is always a big accent on what the elder starts. So it was someone like a wise man with a long beard that people will go travel distances to, to just to see this man, just to be in his presence, and hopefully just to learn just with one sentence of wisdom that can transform their whole lives. Right? So we know many examples like that. History, but nowadays something is missing. We don't have any more kind of authorities. Even the whole idea of authority, of someone who is elder, who will will be able to pass on this this kind of knowledge and wisdom, it's kind of missing. Right? And, and we we are searching for that. That's why one of the reasons that people they try to find anything possible, just to something that can feed them. But we don't have to far away. And in, in the sense that uh, how I find this uh, whole topic that. Um, if, everything, if everything is falling apart, very often in our lives we just go to the basics. We kind of hold on to you, what you know for sure, what the right thing to do, what you're you not know, just feeling, but what you convince what you know is the right thing to do. You hold on to it and you follow it. So that's why I think that what he was able to do, to extract from all these encounters with uh, different uh, people, they have actual similar ideas, it doesn't matter, if from Australia, or Canada, or, or whatever, Ukraine, and that will have the same kind of basic ideas that present all these cultures. He was able to put this all together. And we know that uh, because we don't have this idea of man and, and uh, with regard to uh, development, so most men are over mother or under father's father. Right? This is what we often we see. And the fact that it has actually all, all, all genders, the creating boys who never grow up and want to marry mothers instead of wives, <coughs> and girls who want securing and affirming daddies instead of risk taking partners. So as I said, it affects everybody. So we 
because we all kind of struggle with that, right? Not to mean your partner, your partner, you're kind of equal. There's no matter, you're equal, which is different. Both men and women are in need of initiation. And it, here's what he explained that women, they had uh, a little bit different uh, uh, approach of, of uh, maturing. Well, first of all, it was connected to their own um, menstruation, labor, and menopause. So for a women, so this uh, growing and maturing is very different than for men. It's actually men who had to be, always seem to need some kind of womp on the side of the head that, uh, that they actually, you know, they kind of hit them. So they realize, okay, what should I do in my life? Because kind of woman, naturally, through the physical development, kind of naturally realizing with, uh, you know, with uh, losing blood once a month, whatever, so that they're going through labor and eventually menopause, all these big changes that they learn, these lessons that, that I will mention uh, later, that uh, they kind of naturally going. But for men, we just have to kind of be, be told, basically, be kind of realized from the inside. So, and all these rituals of initiation actually been helping for a young uh, boy to become finally an adult. So, we also have nowadays uh, kind of, uh, we might say, pseudo initiations, but more rebellious. So, for instance, you know, first time to smoke, you know, I remember in Ukraine when I was like, boy, just going somewhere, bushes, you know, smoking some, whatever, just feeling like, then I felt kind of, kind of a headache, you know, and well, you know, that I was really kind of crawling, you know, it was weird. Um, driving a car or breaking the rules, or, or first sexual encounter, or leaving home. So all of this for, for, for young boys are kind of pseudo-initiation. So they're kind of breaking something, what they kind of grew up with, that they need to protest, and in a rebellious way, kind of to, to, to come to conclusions, hopefully, down the road, they will come what really matters. But all of this, I said only pseudo-initiations, because, uh, because initiation, is it the exact opposite? Initiation was something that I have to be to realize that I am part of the bigger union. I have to surrender my own ego, my boundaries, for the sake of something great. So, like in, in Roman Catholic Church, for instance, they uh, kind of kind of positive examples of this initiation is could be opportunity, for instance, like confirmation. Usually, it's happening when 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 when. when um, uh, people are like 14, 13, 14 years old. So it could be opportunity to, 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 to make this kind of transition into adulthood. Um, the same we have a, like a bar mitzvah, right? The same thing that you also have to kind of move from one stage to another stage. Or learning how to use an ax or a knife. You know, sometimes a father can give as a gift a knife to his son. Because to have any knife could be a weapon. But also it, it teaches you, hopefully, uh, the responsibility, because having a knife, you can do a lot of, you can harm, you can do a lot of bad stuff, but most important is not that, the most important that you actually can start carving something, can, can, can make you something with the knife, a very uh, helpful tool. Also, another way, so initiate could be, you know, getting a new name, right, like uh, changing name, losing tooth at hockey, right, so you might say, you see all the hockey players, they, they haven't like one missing one to the you really paid for his kind of sacrifice, right? For, for he's a good player. To be born again, like in Protestant churches, right? Or a lot of people from coming, leaving other churches, traditional churches, going to Protestant church because they would like to be born again, right? They're looking for something new. It's not just attraction for something new, it's something deeper call that something needs to die within me so that I can pick up something new. So this was the whole idea. Or <coughs> baptism with, with immersion, if you're going back to our uh, our churches that we do, right? But the child actually, the child has to be immersed, immersed in the water, so be under water. Basically, has to die because you, when you're under water, you cannot breathe, right? So, and then it meant to, to, to rise in, into a new life, uh, but there is in Christ. So, because the whole thing is not just to kind of give, for instance, um, driving a car, right? The father just kind of gave a keys to, to his son. You know, whatever. He might take this for granted or something like, I didn't even earn to get this. So you take this and you do not know how to use it very often. You don't appreciate it. This will be as a parent. Parents, we, 
We, really, this is what you would like to, to teach our children. So you appreciate small things what you have. You pay for it. You earn it. Because this is the most important lesson in helping you down the road in your life. Because life is hard. You know that. Right? So, in this classical in initiation, was very interesting two elements. Training young men for the necessary discipline and effort required in the ascent of the first half of life. So basically, you're just kind of, kind of climbing the mountain. So when you get, uh, get uh, got to the, to the summit, so then, then eventually you're preparing them ahead of time for the necessary descent and letting go of the second half of life. Okay. So this is what I am kind of learning, and then afterwards I just need to learn how to let it go. A lot of stuff. Initiation was always a teaching about loss and the renewal, darkness and light, four seasons, death and the resurrection, yin yang, the Paschal mystery. Always been kind of this play of love, love and death. One of the most important lessons in initiations was detachment. I need to learn that I, you have to die before you live. So in other words, I need to die before I die. If it makes sense. Because very often, even in our lives, we prepare ourselves for death. Right? This is a topic that we usually don't talk at all. Right? We try to, to skip it, kind of omit it. But when you, if some you know yourself, or maybe someone uh, you know who actually had like near-death experience, for instance, or or got to the point that almost like uh, almost died, and then miraculously sometimes been been able to live again. Very often, those people have a lot to contribute and, and to teach us because we can learn from them. You know, how much they appreciate life. They appreciate every second, uh, single second. Very often, us who don't reflect on these topics, we take for granted. I always have tomorrow. I always wake up tomorrow. I, don't, I postpone things I must do today. I wait to the last point. And, um, and instead of avoiding personal death, they went through a death, a death of their own self, their small life. So basically, this young boy had to go in, in a jungle or a tundra, whatever, and just to be exposed to all this danger. So basically, he, sometimes he might enter this uh, moment even of death, he might die, like literally might die. But only he make it, so it will help him to learn one of the most important lessons in life. Because he wants, as I said, if once you die, you're not afraid anymore of the or the actual death when it will happen in your life. So, um, <coughs> give me a pass now, I will, I will proceed right away to all, what, what were those five most important lessons? So, the first one, the first one was life is hard. I will not give you right away all five. Okay, so it will make you intrigued to the very end. So life is hard. And indeed, all great spirituality is about what we do with our pain. Pain is probably one of the most important words at hospital. Even on the board, they have pain from 0 to 10. So they take very seriously pain. When you say you are in pain, nurse usually will jump in and will give you something to treat this. But at the same time, pain is a part of, of our life, you know, it's something that we all encounter. You know, I know some situations that people take Advil just in case if I have pain. <laughs> we are so afraid of even the whole idea of pain that we try to do everything to remove pain. Again, I'm not saying about chronic pain or something that appropriate pain that, that can be dealt with, um, with medications. Uh, but, but at the same time, we can learn a lot from like a poor countries. Again, not romanticizing them, but we can learn something from from their realities where often they they kind of embrace pain. They realize one important lesson that we do not handle suffering, suffering handles us. It's not us who try to kind of control all of this. Pain is kind of bigger than I am. I need to find a way. I am kind of going through the pain. And the best example for that will be labor, when the woman is in labor. Well, I, I was privileged to be with my wife and four times she, she gave birth um, uh, to our children. And uh, one of the things that I learned in the classes before and being with her in the whole process was that uh, she was telling me as well that she, you have to go along with your pain. 
You know, you cannot resist that. So when you contraction, actually, you have allowed yourself not to fight this pain because the natural response is to, 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 to block pain, right? But you have to go along with that and then, and then really kind of breathe and let it go. Let, let, let it go. <clears throat> so this is what is happening that is allowing the baby to be born. Oxytocin will not give you this, uh, this experience because it kills this whole idea and it allows basically the work of nurse or, or the doctor to, to do easier their job. They don't think of you, they're not thinking about themselves. And, and they're telling you, well, if you're in pain, if you say that, usually you just need to kind of tell us that we will take care of it because it's easier for them. But the whole experience, so this is what again, I'm, this is not, I'm very humble about that because this is my wife that gave birth, not me. Okay? <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, but the way how she explained to me, and my work was crucial for her, she told me that because, because for instance, you know, when she was not breathing properly, whole energy can go into her head. She so turned red, you know. And I told her, what are you doing? Shut the ropes. So somebody was talking about like, breathing. And she said that she didn't remember anyone else who'd been around her, the doctors, etc. But she only remembered what, was I, what I was telling her. That's why I know how much, you know, my role was crucial for her. Because it allowed her actually to breathe properly, so she turned on her kind of and was able to, to let it go then the, the child the child was born the same way with uh, life is hard about pain well look at our crucifix right usually very often we we see the cross as some kind of we put jewelry on it we just use as prekrasa you know some some kind of ornament whatever but very often we forget it was the most horrible death that could be invented in making a person to suffocate and die of his own weight and, and not able to breathe and eventually to die in such a horrible way. So, and, and we place this as a symbol of our faith. Of course, without resurrection, it wouldn't make any sense. It will not be the symbol of our faith, but don't, we don't, sometimes we move too quickly from the crucifix to the resurrection, to the Pascha. We still have to stay more on the cross when actually Christ suffer. Even the word we use, excruciating pain, right? Excrucio, it means coming from the cross. So what it means that, that it, 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 even this term telling us that suffering is actually placed as number, not number one, but it's like a major part in our lives. <clears throat> so, and through the cross of Christ, the journey is into the necessary night. Yeah, we have to go through that. We cannot skip it. Very often as Christians we think that if the resurrection has been granted to us, so we, we will be kind of preserved from experiencing pain and suffering. And I work with a lot of people at the hospital and I can testify to that. But often we kind of feel disappointed in God. Like, why, why do I feel? Why did this happen to me? It's not supposed to happen to me. I go to church, you know, I, I play, I, I live my Christian life, so what's wrong with God? Kind of why He is loving this to happen to me, right? And very often this is not the right way how we see that. This is the way how the person sees, but, but objectively speaking, something you just have to go through the cross. There is no escape from that. Something that happened to Christ is something that we have to encounter as well. <clears throat> Pain, even suffering, when they're not properly processed, very often will be projecting on other people. Or we will be doing kind of scapegoating, you know, kind of blaming other people therefore for my life instead of taking responsibility in our own hands. So how does this relate for, for these men? Well, those men very often they have to be scarred, wounded, symbolically or actually. So they might be even, you know, some kind of blood will, will be kind of, you know, uh, come out, you know, so he will understand that life is hard. It's not part of life to, 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 to work hard. And when you think about a child, so when you compare it now, so a child will not think that life is hard, right? Because when you have a small, it's nothing wrong with that. So this is really kind of demonizing, you know, children, just saying this is the, air, the, the, the age where they are and when they have to move to something else eventually. So the child will not see the life is hard because they just need to make a noise you know, and, and the mom uh, will jump in, or father will jump in, you know, to change the diaper or to, to, to give a water to drink or something to eat, etc. Or just holding in hands, right? So, so thinking that all my needs are, are, are satisfied. 
But every adult know. We all sitting here. I don't think there's a person that we all can testify that, that life is anything uh, but safe. That we all we all find that life is is hard. And there are some people who uh, you know uh, afraid or try to skip it or try to kind of pretend that life is not hard. Well, maybe still in, in process of, uh, of uh, growing up. <laughs> Second uh, lesson. You are not that important. Okay. Life is hard. Second one, you are not that important. Child indeed believes to be in an enormous, enormous importance. Every center around him, and he can do whatever he wants. Right? And even that sometimes we do kind of this, um, uh, we try to, to teach our children, you are special. You are so special, you know? And the child says, I kind of believe in that. So they will see themselves eventually, they are part of the society. Part of the larger group, they have to kind of fit in, but we try to kind of tell them, no, you're so special, you're so different. And making that, we actually do the harm, according to, 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 to Richard Bohr. It's another very interesting book uh, I read, uh, it's called, it's, uh, the author is Jean Twenge, T-W-E-N-G-E. She, at the time of the book is iGen, Generation, but she did a great research on exploring not only millennials but, but even i generations like iPad, iPhone, you know, those who started kind of 10 years ago, whatever. So he, she, she um, uh, interviewed and did a lot of research on that. And, and one of her conclusions are <coughs> that nowadays children, uh, teenagers, they are delaying of maturing. So they are afraid to adult. She's even using the word adulting. So the child doesn't want to adopt. And she said this is phenomenal for me. So like teenagers are kind of postponing their even exploration, uh, like for instance, of driving a car. So they want to do it. And very often it's caused by the helicopter, helicopter parents. They're so cautious, so secure, so, so afraid about the children. They need to do everything for them. So not allowing children even to, to, to have to make their own mistakes, to deal with consequences, because making mistakes is easy. But to deal with consequences and learning from that. This is what the crucial point, because we know like in life, like we often make mistakes, but we have to deal also with, with consequences. <clears throat> also, there are people who are so worried about safe spaces. You know, like I talked to my to my teenager, 15-year-old son, you know, about this safe spaces. You know, sometimes like uh, people are even afraid of an idea. Right? We have a common idea that kind of propelled in the society and just read CBC, whatever, read news online and you will see that. Those are very obvious. But when you present something else, for instance, what the church is teaching on various topics, uh, controversial topics, very often it could be presented as some kind of you attacking my own, what, what, where I am and I don't feel safe with you, so you kind of run away. It's like the idea can hurt you, can kill you. So this is a kind of, kind of a scary situation. Every adult knows that his personal rights are not paramount. They are important, but not like the most important. It's only me who define the world. But very often, like your children, they, they might look like I am the one who say what is right, what is wrong. Like I am the ultimate. I'm in the center, and then I choose you know what what I do, etc., etc. Et then God has to be some kind of satellite, or other people have to be some, but I will be in the center. And also, also like in your own life, or you know, uh, how, how many couples are, are divorced? Very well, often it could be because we didn't have a proper preparation, not just for marriage, but for life itself. <coughs> because we've been all the time kind of uh, preserving, keeping, and being afraid to talk about important things. So, um, yes. But in Christian way, <coughs> it will be something that um, contradicting to it. You're not that important. Because when you think about this, uh, you, you remember this probably illustration from a long time ago that uh, it's like a, a chair, and then you have yourself sitting there, everything else around you. And then with the Christian approach, you would put the Christ, you would put God in this chair, in the center of your life, and then everything else kind of falls around, around that. I remember when I was studying at the seminary, I had a lot of anxieties and fears, thinking, will I graduate, will I finish or not finish, will I find wife, will I, make, will I be ordained, will I have a career, etc. So all normal kind of 
uh, stages I've been going through life. And I remember talking to one guy, and I was telling him, you know, I'm so afraid. And he gave me this one advice, I, I, I remember that, and from time to time I repeat that. He said, you know what? You have to place your anchor in God. You just have to choose Him. If you place Him as number one in your life, everything else will be placed in the right, uh, in the right places. Everything else. Wife, children, career, money, where you live, what happened to you. But very often we, we substitute God with spouse, future spouse, with career, with money, you know, with all these other stuff that are, cannot be God. Right? So that's why we have to, starting at this point, your life is not about you. So placing, uh, uh, <coughs> you're not that important. Your life is not about you. So the third one, your life is not to move you. So the purpose of initiation is to realize that his life is not about him. So that's why they have to confront nature. They have to discard. Drag, in other words, out of their comfortable home. You remember this beautiful story of Tolkien, um, like Lord, Lord of the Rings? So that uh, when uh, Bilbo and Frodo have been summoned by Gumbel to adventure, so they've been living in this nice, quasi safe place, this kind of shire. So everything's been known, everything's been secure and beautiful and safe. And it's a gondol who, who summons them for adventure. So they have to risk, they have to put aside all of this kind of safe life for something more important that, that, that will happen. So they have to leave their safe space. They have to leave the quasi home. They have to risk. So then they will achieve something better. God is calling us out of our own safe spaces. Your life is not about you and His purpose for you. So giving new name. So that's why we have in the scripture that, that Abraham became Abraham, Sarai, Sarah, Jacob, Israel, Saul, Paul, etc. That the kind of giving new name, it's like, it's like you now starting new life. So you turning the page of your past, now you're entering into something new. This is a nice quote I, I, I will share with you. I really like this one. Um, what is the most important question? The important religious question is not that of the rich and young man. Remember, this young man came to Jesus and uh, said, like, what should I do to inherit uh, eternal life? So the essential religious question is the one God, in effect, asks, asks Adam. Who are you and whose are you? So this young man, when he came to Jesus, had been asking me, okay, give me some more rules. Tell me what should I do. So very often, you know, even people, they might leave Christianity and go to other religions because sometimes other religions gives you very simple answers that you just need to follow this and you'll be gone, you'll be good. Right? But the most important question is not that. The most important question is the one that God asked Adam. Who are you and whose are you? So when you, th when you think about this, and then you go, okay, to whom I belong? What is it all about? It's not me who is defining the world, but me as a part of the world. If God called me out of nothingness into being, and He gave me my life, if He gave me myself to me, it means that I don't belong to myself. This is what the scary part is, realizing you don't belong to yourself, right? Because we belong to God. So if I belong to God, it means that my body, my look, my whole, everything that's happening in my life belongs to Him. I'm just like a gift. Someone gave me a gift, and I just need to take care of this gift. And then just kind of then do my best, use it properly, then eventually give back to God. This is what the sacrifice means. This is why in our liturgy, this is what we do, right? We, we have this bread and wine. This initially was brought by faithful people to the church, and then the priest will consecrate it will become body and blood of Jesus Christ. But this whole idea that you bring what you have, yours of your own, on behalf of all and for all, we give to God, not because something He needs, but because we have to give it to Him. And then what He does, he blesses, sacrifices, consecrates, he gives back himself to us. <clears throat> and we are afraid of the second question. Who are you or whose are you? Because only God can answer it, right? 
And his answer seemed too good to be true. <laughs> life is not about you, but you are about life. You are not your own. You are part of the whole. But Beatitudes, right? It was very interesting. Like the whole idea of, of Christ's Beatitudes is like a, like a program for your whole life. All of the Beatitudes relate to someone else. Right? Or if someone else is doing something to you, it's all this mutual relationship. The same way like Mary's fiat, let it happen, let it be your will. Right? So, so she, she it's like, a, very often we, we, we think about Mary as someone who's been so humble, so not important, so she didn't be in touch with herself, she's been kind of not sure, so she just accepted that. I find that Mary is probably one of the most important women in the whole history of, of, of salvation. Why? Because this woman, she knew exactly what she was doing. She made her choice. Because she knew exactly in enunciation that if she will agree to be pregnant, not to be married, it equal death. She was ready to die. Because what was happening to her, she understood that it's not coming just like happening every single day, right? But she was ready to die. Not only that, seeing her son dying on the cross is very often used this example because it's probably the only sanity you can have. Thinking about Mary looking at her son dying on the cross, naked, stripped, humiliated. And they use this example with, with, with the parents who lose their children in death. I say, you know what, the only person who can relate to you, who will really be with you, will be Mary. Because she was able somehow to, to keep her faith to know what was happening, somehow it has a meaning, although she didn't understand, because her son rose from the dead later, right? But she had to have this faith in her. That's why we come into her for our P2U <coughs> to be part, right? So that's why we come in for her for intercession, for protection, because she's the only one who can receive for us the best way. She knows what it means to lose someone, someone you give birth to. So the whole idea is so. Like finding your way is not the point. Define yourself any way you want. You know, I I kind of follow my own life, uh, self actualization, self kind of whatever. The most important is to discovering the treasure that is buried in the field. Discovering the way that God wants to define you. What do you want me to do in my life? If I belong to you and you Lord called me, you wanted me to be. Right? So you have a plan. To discover what you want me to do in life. Well, it doesn't mean necessarily. Sometimes we simplify that. You mean, what? You're going to church and pray all the time, Jesus Christ? You know, it's not that. It means that I have to make God as the center of my life. Simple as that. But when you wake up in the morning, first thing, not to check your phone. You know, check the weather, whatever. But put your kind of socks on or just go to the washroom. Make a sign of the cross. Say, Lord, I begin. I invite you in my life, in my day, whatever happens today, I want you to be inside of my life that I live this day for you. And at the end of the day, when you do examination of conscience, kind of look, okay, how many times I walked away from God's grace today? Or what happened that was so beautiful because I, I was able to see how you've been present in this another person, in this certain circumstances, situation, etc. So when, when we, if we do this as a reference, like every single day, then it'll make total sense. And you will see, okay, I don't worry what will happen to me five years from now. Because honestly speaking, you know, how much control do I have about it? I have none control. I even don't know what will happen tomorrow. I can predict. I do my best. But, it, but I don't have control over it. I don't. It leads me to the fourth lesson like You are not in control. Okay, so I just, just remind the first uh, three so you remember. Life is hard. You are not that important. Your life is not about you. And now you are not in control. Well, child naturally thinks that he's in control. Because when he cries or screams, and he gets what he wants. Well, especially <laughs> growing, having first child in Ukraine, and especially it was the first child in the family for both uh, my parents and my wife's parents. Everybody been kind of, kind of shocked, and, and all, uh, like parents been kind of jumping on the child, trying to, to, to do all of that. They even push, not just me, and, Aside, they push also my wife aside, you know, as they would know, they would remember what to do with a child, you know. They, will, they, they, they didn't, but this kind of fear and, and protection and all of that is like 
hovering, you know, helicoptering patterns, all oh, they're present, they're very strongly. Here is more kind of kind of separate. That's that's a healthier way. That's for sure. Uh, at least we're preserving of, of the marriages, uh, the children, right? So, but uh, but the idea is that the child is kind of growing, which is absolutely normal. That this is natural progress. That that I'm in control. Just make a sign, sound, starting crying, or when the child. You know, sometimes it's funny to see uh, when the child kind of uh, falls down. And the parents just kind of going to, to rescue the child, uh, you know, and the child can get up on its own, but he's not doing that because he's manipulating, right? He's kind of looking for your attention. I mean, sometimes you know, we must to do. I cannot stand it, this cry because it makes me ballistic, going ballistic, right? So, but actually, this is the way how the child is in control, not aware, not viciously. I hope you understand. This is going to happen kind of on purpose. This is kind of normal. So. Um, we are not in control of our life. This is probably the scariest statement you, you, you can hear. Because honestly, uh, you know, we, we, we tell each other, you know, take control of your life, take control of your, you know, finances, your job, your destiny. But our health, body, and especially our failures show us that we are not in control. Those who are have more gray hair than I do, or maybe have no hair, you know, but this better than I do. I talked to my friend, uh, older chap uh, at the hospital and, and he he was teaching me that uh, I was learning this from him that I'm not in control and then honestly when I started kind of noticing some kind of pain in my back or all that I started John like what's happening I never had it like that and he said you're maturing you're moving along you know in, in your life and honestly we don't have control about that but we, we get scared when we just think about this trust so you imagine that God is behind the wheel. And he's the only one who wishes the good for you, right? So he's the one who has a plan for you. If I trust, I let it go, stuff into his hands, so he will be in charge, and I will be just to the passenger seat. I'll also be doing my role, because as a passenger, you play a very important role for the driver. I know this from my experience for eight years. Students are being addressed today at centuries. I was recently speaking with uh, uh, I sit on this military board, the Interfaith Commission on Canadian Military Chaplaincy, and I was talking to the representative of the Evangelical, I don't know what to call it, an association, because they represent like 35 Protestant so-called, excuse me, churches. And so he says to me, you know, we've been around for about a hundred years, that is they, and, uh, and you're talking about events that took place 350 years, 400, 600 years, and those events today are relevant. You can't get my head around that. <laughs> and it is true, you know, these things have been lying more or less dormant. We keep bringing up these events, nobody else does. But um, the Patriarchate of Constantinople has, you know, just been sitting and mulling until the right time to address these matters and today is the right time. Um, so, you had uh, many decisions made by force, by uh, the fact that there are armies occupying territory, someone, excuse me if I get cynical or, or sarcastic every once in a while. Someone said that the canonical territory of the Moscow Patriarchate extends to where there are Russian tanks. And that is, that is the sort of an expression of what, is, what are the boundaries of the Moscow Patriarchate. It's where the tanks are. That's where the, that's where the boundary of the territory is. So, as, as you know from history, Ukraine and its territory were constantly being occupied by foreign uh, forces, foreign nations, foreign states, and uh, you know, in the, in the 17th century, uh, Ukraine was divided into the right bank, the left bank, the right bank, because of the into a peak problem. But actually, you remember Poland. Okay, so that's occupied by Poland. The left bank occupied by the Grand Duchy of Moscovy, still not called the Russia, the Grand Duchy of Moscovy. That's what it was called. It was not called Russia. And, and people can 
confuse, I'm taking it aside, people confuse the word Russia with Moscow. Uh, they don't, or, or they think of Russia, some think of Rus, but that is being the history of Moscow, of Russia, what we call the Russian Federation today. Well, uh, the term Russia was not used uh, regarding Moscow until after 1709, after the Battle of Poltava, and then Tsar Peter the Great gave instructions that from now on, Moscow and its territories will be known as Russia, not the Grand Duchy of Moscow. And they will incorporate the history of Kiev and Rus as their history. So this is the background against which you know, Ukraine and other territories have uh, struggled with. Uh, after the uh, Treaty of Pereyaslav in 1654, uh, the Hetman uh, Bogdan Khmelnytsky signed a treaty with, uh, with Russia. The original does not exist, or if it exists, nobody's seen it for a long time. Uh, Ukrainians interpret that Dobovir as as, uh, as requesting help from the Tsar in their struggles against the Poles. Russians today interpret that as Ukraine has given up all of its rights and has become part of Russia. So in 1954, you had uh, the 300th anniversary of the Treaty of Pereyaslav. You had Konstantin Bankevich wrote the opera of Bank Medetsky. Uh, Sergei Khrushchev uh, uh, gave Ukraine Crimea. So now that also has a role today. So 1654, after this, um, the Tsar and obviously his, the bishops, they started um, trying to incorporate the Metropolia of Kiev into the Russian Orthodox Church. The clergy in Ukraine resisted these things. There was a demand that they all swear an oath to the Tsar. Something like swearing an oath to Adolf Hitler in the Second World War. It wasn't an oath to Germany, it was an oath to the Fuhrer. And this was the same sort of thing. Uh, the clergy resisted this. Uh, there were those among the Kozaks that, just like we have in the government of Ukraine today, uh, those that uh, readily, uh, for their rewards and whatever, supported these moves. They, they, they quickly established their own hetman, Samanovich and started the, the whole machinery of then uh, uh, ordaining, consecrating a hierarchy that would be favorable to Moscow. Uh, in 1448, after the pronouncement by Moscow of its autocephaly, that church was not recognized, or its autocephaly definitely was not recognized by the rest of the Orthodox world. And that was the situation for 141 years, until 1589. And uh, during, anyway, there were all sorts of pressures uh, involved. The, the big Ottoman Empire was at war with uh, Western Europe. Uh, Russia was not yet in the war. Um, Constantinople, did not have, in those, under those conditions, the ability to maintain as close a relationship with Kiev as it would like. The Metropolitan of Kiev also, in his title, was called the Exarch of the Patriarchate of Constantinople, that is direct representative of the, of the Patriarch. Uh, through all of these political pressures, uh, there was a desire from Moscow then to, first of all, they uh, were recognized as a patriarchate, as an independent and autocephalous church. And then they uh, tried to incorporate the metropolia into their uh, 
administrative structures. So uh, under those conditions, there was a delegation from, from Moscow, including Ukrainians, that uh, then approached the Patriarch of Constantinople and the other Eastern Orthodox Patriarchs, particularly the Patriarch of Jerusalem, uh, that the jurisdiction over Kiev would be transferred to Moscow. And now, today, reviewing all of those uh, documents, what actually did happen? Moscow says the Metropolia of Kiev, 100% was transferred to uh, the jurisdiction of the Moscow Patriarchate. And Constantinople says the record doesn't say that. The record says that for some time, um, the Metropolitan of Kiev will, first of all, will be elected by representatives of the cave and metropolia, and that candidate then will be uh, ordained in Moscow, and he will uh, commemorate the Patriarch of Constantinople and then the Patriarch of Moscow. Uh, almost immediately, uh, so there were all these pressures, right? Patriarchs resisted for some time, uh, then the Russians turned to the representatives of the Ottoman Empire and they told the Patriarch, this is, this is going to happen. Russia said, we will hold off entering a war with the Ottoman Empire if you apply this and this pressure so that they will transfer the Metropolitan of Kiev to the Moscow Patriarch. Also, there were bribes involved. Uh, there, that's unpleasant. I don't think that was a deciding factor. I do think the political pressure is what, what did it and could do it again to me. Um, so it took another 100 years from 1589 when the Patriarchate of Moscow was recognized, it took until 1686 for the Metropolia of Kiev to be incorporated into the Russian church. So that situation was enforced by force. That's what enforced means. And, and that existed until the beginning of the 20th century, when you had the, the so-called Russian Revolution in 1917. And with that, you had a rebirth of the aspirations of Ukrainians for independence. As you know, at that time, now we're talking about what happened 100 years ago. What happened 100 years ago in Canada and the United States? What happened 100 years ago in Ukraine? Those events are all tied together. Uh, you had in Canada uh, people who had emigrated mostly from Western Ukraine, mostly Halechan and Bukovetsi. They came to Canada. They quickly started building their own churches and, and community halls. And uh, you had uh, an intelligentsia from mostly from Halachina that started to uh, to make the conscious uh, these immigrants that they were Ukrainians because many of them came as Poles, many of them came as Austro-Hungarians, and those internment camps, right? They were they were they were foreign. Uh, uh, aliens, they were aliens in Canada, and so they were, many were scooped up and into these camps and their property was, uh, was uh, confiscated. You see how interestingly all this is tied in. Um, the Ukrainian Orthodox Church of Canada, after various attempts to establish a, uh, a true Orthodox structure, they, they knew you couldn't have a church without a bishop, and so they started looking for bishops and they approached the Bishop Alexander of the Moscow Patriarchate who at first said that he would take the Ukrainians under his spiritual care but then you know from Moscow they said we don't recognize anybody called Ukrainians they are all Russians and so uh, that did not work and eventually they were able 
to get spiritual supervision by a bishop of the Antiochian Church, Syrian Church, uh, Bishop Germanus uh, Shahedi, who um, lent his authority to the Ukrainian Orthodox Church of Canada and the Ukrainian Orthodox Church, one of the jurisdictions in the United States. This existed until 1924. So back to Ukraine, 1917, or in 1918, already there's a movement for independence of the church in Ukraine. By 19, in the, during the, the time of the Hetman Skorokadsky, and then during the Directoria under Simon Petura, and the Minister of uh, Religions at that time was uh, Ivan Ovienko, our first metropolitan. And, and so, you know, they had a delegation that went from Kiev to Constantinople. Well, this is wartime. Boundaries are changing every week. Uh, during one of these visits, the patriarch had been deceased. <coughs> nothing happened. So nothing came of, of these efforts. In 1921, you had the establishment of the Ukrainian Autocephalus Orthodox Church, which was a very controversial uh, church and established, or its hierarchy established without bishops. That is, uh, the Vasilikovsky was consecrated by priests and laity, not by any other bishops. And so this was a controversy even for some to this very day. One of those bishops was Ivan Teodorovich, who came to the United States in 1924 and uh, led the church in the United States and also was the ruling bishop of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church of Canada from 1924 until 1947. But even he had doubts about his consecration and was re-consecrated by, uh, at that time, the Episcop, uh, Mr. Slav, and uh, uh, Bishop of the Patriarch of Alexander, if I'm not mistaken. Anyway, the Ukrainian Orthodox Church of Canada, also in the person of, I shouldn't put it that way, but the representative of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church of Canada, or the Ukrainian Greek Orthodox Church, as it was known then, but that's Dr. Semen Savchuk, also traveled to Ukraine, met with, uh, at that time, Dr. Ivan Odienko and, and others uh, looking for bishops for Canada, or a bishop for Canada. Nothing came of that trip, but, but you can see how these things were tied in uh, in 1918, 19, 19, 19, 20, 21, those years. So, you had the establishment of the Ukrainian Arcephalus Orthodox Church in Ukraine. Uh, very quickly, the Bolsheviks started liquidating all uh, the churches in the well, Soviet Union was established in 1922, and you had waves and waves of terror. Vladika Vasilikivsky uh, was arrested, eventually he was shot in 1937, uh, as were most of them. Those bishops died, either they were shot or exiled to Siberia, thousands of priests, uh, many, 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 many faithful. And so you had the church almost, almost uh, destroyed in the Soviet Union, Ukraine, Russia, and whatever. So you have now the Second World War, uh, 1939, you have the molotov ribbentrop uh, 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 Treaty signed on aggression pact between Hitler and Stalin, and apparently Hitler was taken by surprise when in 1941, Operation Barbarossa, the invasion of the Soviet Union, and things were not going very well because uh, Stalin had executed most of the uh, of the uh, general staff of the armed forces of the Soviet Union, and so there was a lot of catch-up to do. They were starting to lose the war in 1943. Uh, Stalin decided that he has to turn to the nationalistic, patriotic feelings of the Russians, and so they start uh, 
you know, uh, allowing the church to be uh, rejuvenated, except that the bishops were NKVD agents, and that church was uh, to this, I would say, to a great extent, to this very day, uh, uh, the presence of, of agents of the government, and that's being very uh, delicate. Uh, they exist there to this very day. You had various efforts. Um, I'm not sure whether it was Sidney Eisenstein, a very famous movie director. I'm not sure whether it was he. And they made the film called Alexander Nevsky with uh, Serge Prokofiev wrote the music. But it was the defeat of the Teutonic Knights who were invading Russia by, the, by Alexander Nevsky and those. All of these are efforts to appeal to the patriotic feelings of, of uh, the Russian people. Uh, Ukrainians obviously were being persecuted all along. But I, I speak about that because that is the history of the Russian Orthodox Church and ipso facto the Ukrainian Orthodox Church from the war years to not that long ago. Uh, the church in Ukraine from 1686 began to turn into an agency of the uh, Russian state. Um, I don't think it's a big stretch to say that the hierarchy quickly turned from being leaders of their nation to being servants of a foreign power. What we use uh, and others use the term Yanichara, Janissaries, that, you know, those that serve the enemy and are raised in that kind of mentality. I really believe you can see it every day today. Um, this situation existed until 1989 when in Lviv, Vladimir uh, Yarema, who was formerly a Ukrainian Catholic priest, highly educated, then incorporated, then became part of the Russian Orthodox Church, because in 1946, the uh, Joseph Stalin um, initiated, organized the very false Sobor in 1946 that forced a Ukrainian Catholic uh, clergy to uh, be part of the Russian Orthodox Church and those that didn't want to do this were eliminated or exiled to Siberia. Some then chose to be part of the Russian Orthodox Church and hence Voldemir Yarema was one of those very respected in that church, wrote many, many articles in the, in the journals of the Moscow Patriarchy. Anyway, in 1989, he was one, and there was a, that's Yuri Boyko, uh, in the Spence, that's that, but in view, who proclaimed, ah, I missed one of the autocephalous churches, but anyway, he proclaimed the third formation of the autocephalous church. Let me go back to number two. During the invasion of the of the, the Germans, the Nazis, you know, the, the territory of Poland and much of Western Ukraine was in the hands of of the of the uh, Germans. And under those conditions, yeah, under those conditions, the Ukrainian Orthodox Church. Well, the, the, the Orthodox Church of Poland, which had in 1924 been recognized by the Patriarch of Constantinople as an autocephalous church, based on the fact that it was part of the cave in Metropolia, uh, in, that, in that, that, that Thomas, which is a letter from the Patriarch, it states that the conditions that were instated in 1686 regarding the, the uh, incorporation of the Metropolia Pave into the Russian Orthodox Church, the conditions that were imposed were never fulfilled. And so that part of the cave in Metropolia, which is part of the Polish state, we recognize as an autocephalous church, implying that when the rest of the cave, the territory of the cave in Metropolia 
will find itself under other political conditions, it is also deserving of the status of autocephaly. And I'm sure that there's the Thomas that will come soon uh, concerning the autocephaly of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church of, of Ukraine will refer to this letter of 1924. So, the clergy in, in, in Poland, and then it was part of Volin as the Germans came in. So that church then started to ordain uh, bishops for for Ukraine. Amongst them were Vladimir uh, Mstislav and and uh, Mikhail of Toronto, and, and a whole slew of of, of, of bishops. Um, yeah, all of all of them. Yes. Um, so, as the Germans were retreating, so all of these bishops also left that territory because they would have been killed by the invading Soviet forces, and that's how they ended up in Germany. And eventually, many came to North America. I won't go into that history. So. We have to wait until 1989 for the proclamation of the third autocephaly. I would say these three autocephalies, they don't have anything in common with each other except for the name. Uh, but anyway, that's what happened. But they, they eventually uh, had a bishop of the uh, Moscow Patriarchate, Lodeka Ioan Bodnarchuk who spent some time in Toronto at one time. You may remember he was there, visited St. Demetrius Church, was in the, the, the Western Hospital for an operation and recovered in Toronto, uh, no longer among the living. Um, he and another bishop, they say, of the Russian Orthodox Church in exile or inside of Russia. Anyway, they, that church, uh, turned to Vladimir Mstislav in South Bound of New Jersey to be the first patriarch of this church to which he agreed and then we start a whole history. Uh, you have the Metropolitan of Kiev of the Moscow Patriarch in the person of uh, today Patriarch Filaret who uh, was facing a certain choice. You had, uh, in 1991, you had the, the failed putsch in Moscow, you remember, they speeded up the process of the collapse of the Soviet Union. Then you had the presidents of Russia, Ukraine, and Belarus, who signed a, a, uh, a document declaring the uh, collapse of the Soviet, the dissolution of the Soviet Union. And on the 24th of August, 1991, uh, uh, Leonid Kravchuk proclaimed uh, independence of Ukraine. So what was the reaction of the Russian Orthodox Church in Ukraine at that time? Uh, Metropolitan Filaret said that he, First of all, the government declared there would be a referendum on the independence of Ukraine on the 1st of December. Um, Metropolitan Filaret stated that he would hold the Sobor on the 3rd of December to uh, declare what their position would be. As things got closer, he changed his mind and said we will hold the Sobor before the 1st of December. They held the Sobor. They uh, declared their church as autocephalic, or requested that the Moscow Patriarchate recognize the church in Ukraine as autocephalous. All the bishops, all the representatives who were there of the monasteries and other institutions and representatives of the laity including the present Metropolitan of Kiev Unufri, also signed this document requesting autocephaly. Mm -hmm. This was done in 1991 and then again in 1992. Uh, when this was done, uh, Metropolitan Filaret was called to Moscow and obviously got a very big dressing down and uh, 
said that he has to resign. He said he would resign, but in Kiev, he returned to Kiev, said, I changed my mind. <laughs> and, and so this church was, uh, or the, the hierarchy was in a lot of, uh, was in a difficult situation. Uh, the Moscow Patriarchate called a sobor in Kharkiv. It's called by Metropolitan Nikodim. And that sobor elected Metropolitan Volodymyr Sabodan, who was a bishop of the Russian Orthodox Church, not a bishop of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church of the Moscow Patriarchate. So the calling of this sobor caused two problems. One, the uh, bylaws of that church registered with the government state that a sobor of this kind can only be called by the Metropolitan of Kiev, and the Metropolitan of Kiev can only be selected from among the bishops of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church, uh, Moscow Patriot. So those two, principles were violated because the Sobor in Kharki was not called by the Metropolitan of Kiev, and the successor to Filaret was not chosen from among the bishops of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church of the Moscow Patriarchate, but of a bishop from, from Russia. He's Ukrainian and a patriot, I believe. Uh, so you, then you had this situation. You had the situation where uh, this Church now led by Lodeka Filaret, which started really with a handful of parishes. Today is some around 5,000 parishes. Uh, they started working towards uh, a union with the Ukrainian Autocephalous Orthodox Church, the one established in 1989. Uh, this was done against the wishes of the patriarch Mstislav, and his uh, opinions were ignored. Eventually, in 1993, in Grimsby, Ontario, he passed away. And I remember on the Sunday following his passing, I had a visitation in London, Ontario. It was the Lani Siata. And I remember doing the service, Ovid, and then driving all the way to Grimsby, where I served the Panakheda there. Um, anyway, so you had this autocephalous church, half of it, did not join with Filaret, and half of it did. Well, I don't know whether they were half and half, but parts of it were. And then you had this whole situation from 19, uh, from 1991, 92, 93, up to the present day. The Ukrainian Orthodox Church of Canada in 1990, by a vote of some 76% of the uh, voting uh, delegates at its Sobor in 1990 uh, elected to uh, be under the Patriarchate of Constantinople. Five years later, the Ukrainian Orthodox Church of the USA uh, went through the same process. And since then, we have uh, obviously had many, many contacts because we were traveling to Constantinople at least once a year, sometimes two and three times. Uh, I remember in 1990, uh, Mitropolit uh who had been leading this process, was sick in the hospital in Winnipeg following a heart operation, and uh, uh, information came from Constantinople that our issue was uh, coming to an end and they would require ask him to come to Constantinople for the completion of this process. I had been a bishop only for six months. I had been consecrated in October of 1989 and so our Metropolitan List said I am ill. Would you accept my uh, auxiliary bishop? Which they said yes and at the end of March of 1990 I and the Pat Stepan Yarmus, and then the chair of the Presidium of the Consistory, traveled to Constantinople, where a Thomas regarding our relationship with Constantinople was read. 
We accepted it to be brought back to the Pregnant Orthodox Church of Canada and the Sobor in July of, 19, of, of 1990, uh, as I said, by a vote of some 76%, uh, re uh, accepted that, that um, relationship with Constantinople. From that time to today, I and others from the Ukrainian Orthodox Church of Canada have always brought up the whole issue of Ukrainian Orthodoxy, uh, its history, the need for uh, uh, independence. Uh, I'm not saying that it's, we are, are part of many, 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 many people in the diaspora and in Ukraine who have constantly been raising this subject with the Patriarch of Constantinople, various representations and, and by clergy and laity uh, opening the doors for the cave and Patriarchate because they're not recognized by Orthodoxy, either the Autocephalous Church, for them to, to be able to eventually communicate for the last four or five years directly with the Patriarchate of Constantinople. Previously, we would, we would convey information, messages, feelings. Uh, the thing is, what, so what, why are things different today? They are different today because Ukraine is different than it, more than it was five years ago. 19, in 2014, you had, uh, first of all, I think it was in 14, Crimea was occupied by those little green men, and, and the forced referendum said we are that we want to be part of Russia, uh, which uh, then started the persecution of not only Ukrainians but a great number of Tatar who are Muslim persuasion. Um, you had the invasion as well. You had the separation and the invasion of by Russian forces of the unrecognized by us, at least, uh, the Nets People's Republic and the Luhansk People's Republic. And you've had this war going on that's caused the deaths of some 10 and a half rising number of people. And uh, it's caused a major, major problem for um, NATO and, and uh, the European Union, the United States, um, you know, there was a thing called the Budapest Memorandum, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Budapest Memorandum yeah. which was a document signed by me, when me, France, me. Germany, mm -hmm. no, Russia, France. not France, United States. United States. And so that was a guarantee that if you gave up your nuclear weapons, you know, the territory is, uh, the integrity of the territory is, uh, is uh, guaranteed. You know, previous to that, the Helsinki Accords said, said that the boundaries of Europe, following the Second World War, are the boundaries that we will maintain. And so none of that has been, at least not been defended by military means. And so you have this situation. You have, you have uh, a Ukrainian government that is starting to serve the, the Ukrainian people. Everyone complains and so-called trickle-down economics. Maybe you haven't trickled down that far. But you have had, under the present government, more reforms than ever over the last uh, in the last, during the last uh, four years than you've had in the last uh, 25 years. Um, all of these things, you've had direct representation to the Patriarch of Constantinople, twice by the Ukrainian Orthodox Church of the Moscow Patriarchate, 1991-92, recently by the Haven Patriarchate, Ukrainian Autocephalous Orthodox Church, the government were called Narada, and you had this big change in the geopolitical situation. Uh, 350 years ago, uh, Moscow pressured Turkey, Turkey pressured the Patriarch. Today, Turkey is on the side of the Tatar. Five to six million Muslim Tatars are part of the diaspora in Turkey, and Turkey has a better relationship with Ukraine than it has with Russia. So hopefully that pressure doesn't exist. 
Um, in, in 2016, you had the great Orthodox war in Crete, which was in the process of being prepared for 50 years. In January of that year, you had all of the autocephalous Orthodox churches um, agree. They would all be present. They were making uh, amendments to the various documents that would be discussed and so on. By the time uh, that's, that council came about, you had the Patriarchate of Moscow, Bulgaria, Antioch, and uh, Georgia not come to the Sobor. Uh, the Patriarchate of Serbia first said they would not come, eventually they came. And uh, all of these events served to insult the Patriarch of Constantinople. He had asked us all in Ukraine and outside not to make any waves in the year or year and a half before the Sobor and said that this issue would be addressed after. Um, so we're, we're into what has happened in the last six months. On the 17th of, of April, President Poroshenko, upon arriving home from a subsequent meeting with the Patriarch of Constantinople, said, God Cephali will be pronounced very soon, and we need to prepare, and we need to do this, and this, and this. And we expect that the pronouncement of God Cephali will take place before the Quran or before the 28th of July, which is the 1,030th anniversary of the baptism of Ukraine. And there are many, many pronouncements back and forth. The Patriarchate of Constantinople said, we have made the decision to uh, take the process leading up to the pronouncement of our setting to its conclusion. Um, Moscow Patriarchate, it seems, didn't take this too seriously. But as time has gone on, it's become closer and closer. Uh, the bishops, or the ruling bishops of the, of the Patriarchate of Constantinople were summoned to Constantinople for the 31st of August. And uh, this is a, an event that takes place now every three years. It took place uh, in 2015, a year before the Great Sobor in Crete. And so the issue would be the decisions of the Sobor in Crete, but mostly the issue in Ukraine, in Macedonia. And so on the 30th, the Patriarch of Moscow, Kirill, uh, requested to meet with the Patriarch of Constantinople. So they were there a day before we started our meetings. I arrived on the, uh, I left here I think on the 29th, arrived on the 30th. No. I left on the 28th and arrived on the 29th. And so the next day, uh, Patriarch Kirill came and I think most of you have followed those events. The discussion uh, following a uh, press conference, and, and you know, he arrived with 15 uh, security people. <laughs> and uh, 15, you know, they're scared. You know, the 15 that's, that's, that's the form. And, and uh, you know, uh, Vladeka Ilarion, our Vladeka from Edmonton, uh, was, uh, no, first of all, it was. Uh, It was what they cut. No. Well, Nick had done the year of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church of the USA uh, had been summoned to uh, that meeting, at least the initial public relations meeting, uh, in case they needed some more uh, translations in Russian English. Um, and then I was supposed to have a breakfast with Vladeka Ilarion. In the middle of that, he received a text to also to go. I think maybe they just wanted two Ukrainian bishops in the room. Uh, it's always unnerving for the Russians to have a Ukrainian bishops say sloppy sisters. <laughs> anyway, um, 
you may have seen that uh, one of the, uh, I guess, waiters, you know, he works at the, at the patriarch, he was walking around with a, with a, with a tray of water, and they, they gave it to the patriarch of Moscow, and he reached, and one of the security guys would take that one. Yeah, so <gasps> very, very insulting. And so then after this, they had uh, three hours of meetings, and only, uh, yesterday or the day before uh, excerpts I didn't know that it was taped uh, but there were excerpts regarding Ukraine and the uh, personal relations that were presented very very nasty uh, response the patriarch of Bartholomew spoke very openly about what has been uh, on his uh, in his heart uh, these last number of years, and, and uh, it's now an English translation, you can get it, it's very much uh, about the Council of Crete, particularly Ukraine, uh, Patriarch of Moscow said, how can you support a government in Ukraine that only has 8% support? Um, Patriarch said, how is it that the government of Ukraine won't allow you or Metropolitan Ivarion Alfeyev to come to Ukraine because they are persona non grata. Mm -hmm. Shows you the support mm -hmm. that you have amongst uh, Ukrainians and all of these sorts of back and forth. I, I urge you to, to, to go take a look and see it's all over the internet. Um, following, up, so during, while we were in Constantinople, we had Synaxis, the Sobor. Uh, Council. We did not vote on anything. We listened to various uh, theological presentations. One was um, the history of uh, the authority of the Patriarch of Constantinople to grant autocephaly, uh, the historical overview that the Patriarch of Constantinople does not need anyone else's support to grant. Later, there's who recognizes, recognizes. Sometimes it takes 20, 30 years. Um, and the other one was that the Patriarch of Constantinople has the right to listen to appeals by metropolitans and bishops of other patriarchates that appeal and say, you know, there's something wrong with this, or I was unjustly uh, uh, punished or, or whatever, or process was wrong. So this had to do with the future of uh, rehabilitation of uh, Patriarch Filaret and the bishops that he has consecrated over the years. Um, following these various presentations and, and overwhelmingly the support to the Patriarch for his decisions, not only in the matters of Ukraine, but also of recognizing the autocephaly of Macedonia. Uh, it's also going to cause uh, waves for the Serbs and others, but that's one. Uh, following this meeting, the Patriarch appointed uh, our Archbishop Daniel of the, of the USA and Vodeka Ivarion of Edmonton as his emissaries. Here, the word exarch means emissary, it does not mean rulers. And they are in Ukraine. I think Vodeka Daniel is in the United States at the moment, will be returning to Ukraine because he left for the United States. The Patriarch Castle de Padri to go to Ukraine so that Vodeka Ivarion would not be on his own. You know, they are there as, as they were before the 28th of July under guard. <coughs> they are there in, in government facilities and they, wherever they go, they're like diamond shaped, you know, one in the front, one in the back, two on the sides. Absolutely, they are being looked after in that sense. Their, their duties there are to uh, interview, review, study the biographies of those bishops of the Cavan Patriarchate, of the Autocephalus Orthodox Church, 
and those eight to ten purported bishops of the Moscow Patriarchate who signed an appeal to Patriarch Bartholomew that they support autocephaly. Mm -hmm. So once that process is over, they will organize a sobor in Ukraine, and those will be the bishops of a new church structure. There will no longer be Kievsky Patriarchate. There will no longer be Altikofaya Natsarkha. You will have those of the Moscow Patriarchate who will who will remain. How many of them? Who knows? And that there's another process there that the government is leading towards forcing them. I hate to use that word force, but eventually coming around to them being called the Russian Orthodox Church in Ukraine and not the Ukrainian Orthodox Church. The Ukrainian Orthodox Church will be the name of the new church structure made up initially of these bishops that I have just spoken about. And they, at, their, at this first meeting, will choose a primate. And that is who will receive the letter or the Thomas from the Patriarch of Constantinople uh, proclaiming autocephaly for the Ukrainian Orthodox Church in Ukraine. Uh, that was placed on Hetman Ivan Mazako. After the, the, the Battle of Poltava, whatever, uh, Hetman Ivan Mazako and Kalip Orlik, you know, the one who created the first constitution of Ukraine, well, they went into like Nagimihratsu, in, in and so they. They were in, in, in uh, said in that, uh, uh, Romania, whatever. And anyway, but they they right away established relationship with the Patriarchate of Constantinople. And Ivan Mazaka was buried by a metropolitan of the Patriarchate of Constantinople. So this anathema of mine, and they said, why would we, they not recognize anathema? Because it had nothing to do with dogmas had nothing to do with the canons, it had to do with politics. And so that principle is going to be applied to Filaret. That his anathema was not because of dogmas or canons, but because he happened to use the word autocephaly. Whatever sins he as a person has, I guess he has, 80% of those bishops have them also. And nobody said a word until he said, of the Pithraya. So I think I think that this, the, the Holy and Sacred Synod in Constantinople meets on the 9th, 10th, and the 11th of October. And I'm sure this is the issue, this one, and maybe already the pronouncement. No, they, they won't pronounce the auto-separate right now. Uh, they need to hold a sobor. But the issue of the rehabilitation of Pilare, I think that's uh, a few days away. Why don't you ask some questions? Maybe there's a whole bunch of things I haven't thought should be to The status of the Pechaska Lavra cave? Yeah, the status of the Lavras, particularly cave, the cave of Pechaska and Pochai, they, that those institutions are in the hands of the Moscow Patriot. Yeah. Okay. So, they, they are in the hands, that is, they are, they are in their use. That is, they have the right to use that property those properties, as many, many, many others, are uh, the property at this time of the Ministry of Culture of Ukraine. Those lavras were given by the Ministry of Culture for the use of that church for a certain length of time. Kevo Pecharska Lavra, if I'm not mistaken, their term of use, signed by President uh, Yanukovych, was till 2050. Oh, oh, really? oh, wow. I'm not saying that it's going to be that, and they are, the government of Ukraine, I'm sure that is that there will be processes, uh, and hopefully that there won't be force used. I, I, you know, the worst thing right now would be for uh, there to be bloodletting and whatever, so the whole world will scream at those Nazi fascists and the Ukrainian government were destroying. Uh, Holy Russia's uh, church in Ukraine. Don't, nobody needs that. There, there, things are being done one step at a time. 
the, the Ukrainian government, I was in Ukraine at the end of July. I met with representatives of the government. They said we had already had meetings uh, on, uh, uh, on a oblast level about the need to re-register uh, all of the churches in Ukraine. That is, uh, the property of the churches in Ukraine are not the property of FRPs or national churches. All the properties belong to the individual members of the parish. They are creating the mechanism for the transfer from one jurisdiction to another. It's one thing to say, yeah, you can transfer, but how do you do this peacefully? What are the legal steps that you need to do to change jurisdictions? So you have, uh, obviously, bishops of the Moscow Patriarchate are not very happy that, that, because they want the bishop to be able to say yes or no. Well, obviously, he's going to say no. But, but here, each parish will decide what it will do. Where there are more than 50% that want to go to the new church, that will happen. Where there are less, they will build a new church. Or if it's 50-50, hopefully they will alternate and move to conserve. I know that's not a very uh, good solution for anyone. But there are, just pronouncing autocephaly is the beginning of the process, not the end of the process. There's a, it's going to take another 20, 30, 50 years for this all to work itself out. What about, the, and what about the theft, supposedly, of, of uh, you know, uh, religious icons, it property, made, well, cash? I, I read online, I don't know if it's right, true, right. there was a, a protodiakon from Kiev, uh, Pachetska Lavra, who was caught at the border by the Ukrainian border with patrol with 35,000 US dollars, right. and he didn't declare it. Right. Well, I don't know what happened to that. Uh, that I, I don't know either. Well, I mean, it's not, it's, a, it's not much money compared to what you're talking about. I know. But, but, but still, it's the principle of the thing. Okay. Well, I mean, it, it's like everything else. It's one incident at a time, you know. You have to have the, the people that are going to be able to detect, evaluate, arrest, prosecute, sentence. I mean, I mean our, our Ukrainian nation has been bleeding people and resources for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, and somehow we're still here. Uh, hopefully, those wounds will get much, much smaller. Yeah. Um, so, where does the issue stand of the transfer of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church of Canada and so the Ukrainian Orthodox Church of the United States um, from the Patriarch of Constantinople to um, a canonically recognized uh, patriarchate in Ukraine? Okay, that's, a, that's an interesting question that I think uh, we will be faced with uh, in the future. You know, those the kinds of decisions are made at a sobor of the church. So the church will have to have a discussion, first of all, whether to leave the patriarchate of Constantinople. You know, I shouldn't say this in public, but right now I wouldn't be doing anything at the moment. You know, what happens if, for instance, for instance, the Ukrainian Orthodox Church of Canada, uh, and with the blessing of the Patriarch of Constantinople, becomes part of the uh, administrative structure of the church in Ukraine. Right? And a week later, the Russians invade Ukraine yeah. and yeah. take yeah. it over. And where does that put the Ukrainian Orthodox Church of Canada? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's all I'm saying. Is that yeah. I'm saying that that we will be faced with many questions that we will have to come up with answers. Things will definitely change. They will change for us. They will change for the next generation. There will be questions. Here's, a, here's one for you. Uh, we haven't talked about the Ukrainian Catholic Church at all. Right? Uh, it seems to me the Ukrainian Catholic hierarchy in Ukraine is very, very nervous. Because 
I have the feeling that I've had for a long time that there will be a sizable number of Ukrainian Catholics faithful, not talking about Catholic bishops, but faith who will be joining the Ukrainian autocephalous Orthodox Church. Not because of dogmas or canons, but because it's uh, Ukrainian church. Uh, uh, you know, in 400 years ago, most of the people there did not become Catholics because of dogmas and, and, and canons, but because the political situation forced them to become Catholics. And that would be the same situation now. Now, for instance, if you had a, a large movement of Ukrainian Catholics to the Ukrainian Orthodox Church in Ukraine, what about the Ukrainian Catholics in the so-called diaspora, right? If, they, if there's a, a desire to be part of that church of, of faith, and the Ukrainian Orthodox Church of Canada is under Constantinople, what incentive is there for Ukrainian Catholics in Canada to join the Ukrainian Orthodox Church of, of Canada if it's under Constantinople and not under Cain. These are some of the questions that are going to be, have, will have to be worked out and, and people will have to come to a conclusion and the sobor will, you know, have to take place and people will vote and what are we going to do? I think there, in spite of these kinds of, I think the future for Ukrainians everywhere is extremely bright. I think that uh, uh, you know the Ukrainian Orthodox Church of Canada has its own challenges: falling numbers, no money. You know, can't buy somebody a cup of coffee almost. And you know, serious. And and in spite of all that, I really think that uh, the future is extremely, extremely bright for Ukrainian Orthodox and Ukraine in general. You know. I, I, I've made this point a number of times, and I compare a hundred years ago and a hundred, you know, what has happened. A hundred years ago, nobody knew Ukraine or Ukrainians and didn't want to know, and didn't want to know anything about them. What were Ukrainians, what, what was their reputation in Canada a hundred years ago? Well, what is it today? Nobody. Everybody on the street knows about Ukraine. Okay, first of all, it was Chernobyl and started. But, but you have a whole generation of young Ukrainians who grew up without the Soviet Union, uh, who were, first of all, wow, we have nuclear weapons. Uh, and then, wow, look at the soccer team we have. You know, there's a different Ukrainian mentality out there amongst people who are 20 years and younger very different from our mentality. And I think, I think in Ukraine, oh, you know, we were heroes sending jeans to Ukraine and who's the <laughs> Now they can buy us a hundred times over. Mm -hmm. But you have young people, 20 years old, that are no different from young people here. They're all walking around in Nike, running shoes and t-shirts, and they're all, you know, they used to know Ukrainian speak and Russian. English. They, they speak English. Absolutely. And they're all on the computer. Mm -hmm. And they all have dreams. Silicon Valley. 70% mm -hmm. are Ukrainians. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think Ukraine and the, the, the whole issue of Ukrainian orthodoxy is just... Uh, I, I'm thinking in the future that when you have this new church that will be in communion with the rest of the orthodox world, that will share its music. It's art, it's architecture, it's publishing, it's theologians that are coming down. I think it's going to be fantastic. I really do. Yes, uh, please pray for a visa free regime for Ukrainians to Canada. Yes. Russian. Okay, yeah, this is. Uh you're looking to the future, but I have a question about the past. Now, this whole idea of uh, canonically recognize that the Moscow church is, the Ukrainian church is, a, how does this go back to the fact that in fact, in 1943, that Moscow 
church was essentially founded by Stalin. Right. Mm -hmm. And how, how did it become recognized as the canonical church? Well, because that, those breaks never took place. I mean, there was no suspension of, of communion between the church of Russia and the others. Very, very Even though high. the hierarchy was all well, either shot I mean, or nobody, nobody uh, functioned from that kind of premise, and the Russian Orthodox Church is will have to go through many, many, many years of cleansing of itself. I, I believe that it will eventually come to that. Because I, mean, I, we, I, I think that everyone should should also desire for Russia and Russians to become a democratic, freedom-loving culture, so that. But, but, you know, I think the process is, and I think it's a great fear of Vladimir Putin, is to see a successful Ukraine functioning and, and a society based on other than force and blackmail and pressure. And, and I think Russia needs to go through those processes and we should do extent possible support those those uh, uh, movements for democracy and honesty whatever and, and and support those I mean there are people being assassinated there who are resisting a force that is tremendous and and uh, you know the church in Russia will uh, you know this generation will die off in the next one and the next one and eventually I hope that there will be a normal functioning Orthodox Church in Russia also. But was that in fact reinstatement legitimate in well, 43? I, I, I'm not going to say that yeah. because I, I I think there just as the whole question of 1686 and the whole history of Ukraine and its relationship with Constantinople and the relationship with Moscow, those are questions that will have to be faced in the future. Mm -hmm. There will have to be all kinds because of Because there are studies. lots of Ukrainians that still see that, you know, that that's a canonical church. Yeah, but I mean, you, can have, you might have a Ukrainian canonical church next week. Well, yes, we so hope that. So what does that, that have uh, to do with us? You know, well, that church in Ukraine of the Moscow Patriarchate will be known as the Russian Orthodox Church yeah. in Ukraine. And if you want to be part of that church, no one's going to stop you. Mm -hmm. You know, the whole point is to have a, 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 a free decision. I think the Moscow Patriarchate is going to lose tremendous amounts of, of uh, faithful once there is another canonical alternative in Ukraine, which there has not been for, for 30 years. Um, can I ask the first two questions? Some of them are kind of related. Nichute, you want to feel static? Can you get up so we can hear your question? Sorry. Can I ask uh, two or three questions? Like uh, some of them uh, kind of related. Uh, what is your opinion, and um, is it enough pressure from government of Ukraine for kind of security forces of Ukraine on uh, Ukrainian Orthodox Church, uh, Moscow Patriarchate? Because uh, some people within uh, this church, they are not bishops, uh, just just basically like ordinary people, place great role within this church, that kind of uh, anti-Ukrainian right. role, they like going to Warsaw, going to Istanbul, um, and another question... They need, they need bigger soup. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what is uh, your opinion about uh, Metropolitan Ufri? How is this uh, figure dependable on Moscow? Like, and my third question, like uh, we have Metropolit uh, Alexander Derbenko, how many bishops like that? And like, what 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 is your uh, first of all? Um, as far as those lay people that you mentioned, uh, who are uh, doing things that we think are traitorous. Uh, you know, the Ukrainian government 
itself has to uh, enforce the laws that it has, and if it doesn't have enough, it has to bring in new laws. I mean, it's part of the reform. I mean, it's part of the big picture of anti-corruption legislation. And, uh, I mean, there are there are many many things, and in spite of these, the laws that they pass them, someone has to enforce them. And you know, it's just somebody gets on the phone, don't touch that one, don't touch that one. That either they have to uh, address that with. Uh, the people that they have, or they have to wait for people to die. It's a very painful process to watch those things. As far as the uh, Ladeka they're all free to do whatever they want. They are free to function in any way that they want, as long as they don't break the laws of Ukraine. Um, one thing the government, I'm sure, is going to find a mechanism to have their name changed from the Ukrainian Orthodox Church, Moscow Patriarchy, to the Russian Orthodox Church in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. So, so people will know where they where they're going. Yeah. I think that that it's going to take a, a long time, maybe generations, for that church. It's going to be very small, I think, soon. But I think it's going to take a long time for people. Those that are left to slowly intermarriage, all of those processes will take a time. I just wanted to say that we have a few questions. We don't have a lot of questions. But I'm pretty good. 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 Чи перекуска. Так що, будь ласка, ще пару питань. Ну, ти будеш і you will have two alternatives in Ukraine. I think the only way to destroy this alternative that is coming is to force. Um, and I don't know, I mean, it's, it's theoretically possible that in the next presidential elections that President Poroshenko may lose, maybe not. Um, If the elections are honest, it's very possible that we'll have a president of the same or similar views of President Poroshenko. Um, if you have, you know, Medvedchuk and that whole group, then it shows something about the Ukrainian nation. It shows the Ukrainian nation is not yet mature to have this. I don't think it's going to happen. I really think that uh, our sector will be declared before the next elections, probably by the end of this year, um, a thousand years from now, people will be talking about Patriarch Bartholomew and President Poroshenko. Mm -hmm. I believe that. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not here supporting him, I'm just saying that for for Autocephaly to come during the time of any president, that president will be remembered. Is it true that he's a diacon? Uh, you know, I, uh, I don't know whether he's a diacon, but somehow I, I think he's probably a equal diacon, a subdeacon, as is Mr. Novinsky. I mean, I think, I think when you read diacon, and you, uh, you've read that talk from the column of Carascuzio, I think he may not be very versed verse in, in the titles of various uh, um, church workers. I think it might be in this place. I, have you seen him serve as a deacon? Never. You may have seen some pictures of him 
10 or 15 years ago, but I don't think he was dressed as a deacon. I think he may be dressed as a sub deacon. I don't have the opinion that the wave is starting the genies out of the bottle. I don't know if it's Maybe that's a bad analogy, but the momentum is there. Oh, yeah. There's no, the only thing I'm concerned is that right now is the Turkish government. Mm -hmm. I, I was just going to mention that uh, the Moscow Patriarchate has a lot to lose in many, many, many different aspects. Uh, uh, I'm reflecting back on a book, I don't know if anybody here read it, called Understanding Orthodoxy by Timothy Ware, who uh, is an Anglican who converted to Greek Orthodoxy and is now like... Just saw it three weeks ago. Wow. He's, he's, he's still still swear. Swear. Yeah. If you ever have a chance, read this book. It was written, I think he wrote it when he converted back in the 50s. But it explains in intimate detail. He said he would rewrite the section on Ukraine. Really? Yeah, because there's a different kind of mindset. Well, anyways, uh, if, he states a lot of facts. And the facts are these. Ukraine is like the farm team for the Russian church. In that they supply the theologians, they supply the priests. They supply the monks, they supply the nuns, they supply the composers, they supply the, the, the directors, and so on. And if it wasn't for Ukraine, it wouldn't have a church. And when I would look at all the, the, the last names of the priests in the Moscow Patriarchate, they're all Ukrainian. They're all Ukrainian last names. You know, so if this happens, which I think it will, they're going to stand to lose a lot because well, I, was, I was in Ukraine last summer, briefly, teaching English uh, through music. There was a friend of mine, Tadas Mariuszynski in Winnipeg, in Ternopik. And we had a, a lot of young professionals who just finished university. They want to learn English, and they were there every night, mostly women. Unfortunately, or fortunately, whatever. It was mostly women and less men. They showed up, and then they disappeared after a few classes. But the main thing is, the main thing is, is that the spirituality that was there, just blew me away. You know? like I went to head Mademoiselle's church in Ternopil. He got married there. I don't know if it was his first marriage or second marriage there, but 400 years ago. You know, it, it, they, and then, then I went to a uh, Ukrainian Catholic uh, uh, Zarvanetsia, mm -hmm. which is phenomenal. You know? So uh, when this happens, this uh, uh, almost, I think there's going to be a spiritual way to swing it over here to North America. And, you know, uh, Maybe make it a visa free regime, which I really endorse. The Ukrainians are hardworking people. That's why they brought them here 120 years ago. Who are the hardest workers? Ukrainians. They opened up the West. They built the farms. So when we get them over here, they'll bring along everything that they uh, have there. The spirituality is just phenomenal. You know? And it was just, uh, I was really taken with that. So I wanted to share that with you. Thank you. Знаєте, велика то, що сталося, що ви приїхали за місто Дика Андрія, то був Божий пропуск. Ні, ми йому скажемо, що з ним було б ще ліпше. Ми трошки більше з жінками з жінками забув варіантів, і у нас двох запросів.